Welcome to the Recruitment Rollercoaster podcast. My name is Hisham Azuz. Today I'm joined by Justin Pearson, who is the founder of Hive, a management consultancy helping recruitment owners that want to scale and grow the equity value of their recruitment business. And previous to this, Justin was the founder of a recruitment business called Human Capital, which he exited through an MBO in 2017. Justin, uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Isham. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me on. No, it's been, um, I know I normally always say this, but I, I, I am really looking forward to this conversation. Um, obviously, um, Cal Pesh kindly introduced us and sort of said uh, sort of the sort of mission you're on right now feels like it could potentially give a lot of value to the listeners and Cal Pesh has been involved in the podcast already. So it's been great to sort of find out more about you and your journey because I think um, it's unique and something that I think a lot of people can learn and, and get value from. So I'm really excited to dig into it. Um, yeah. But where I always like to start on this podcast, Justin, is uh, how did you enter the world of uh, recruitment? <laughs> um, well, it's a while ago now. It was in the, um, in the late 90s. Uh, I mean, it basically, did uni, went traveling, probably a bit too long. I was away for about three years. Um, finally came back and I, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do as a job. Um, uh, my father trained as an accountant. He, uh, he suggested that I might want to try that if I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't really want to do that, to be honest with you, but I thought, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I went along, one of the places I went to try and get a job as a training accountant was I, I went to Michael Page to see if they could help me find a job. And, yeah. um, uh, uh, sort of 30 seconds into the, uh, into the interview, um, the interviewer, uh, actually a lady by, Kurt, by the name of Kirsten McLeod, who is still recruiting today, um, uh, said, you don't want to be an, an accountant. <laughs> no, you're right. I don't. I'll, I'll get my coat. And, um, and actually, should I have thought about recruitment? And um, it kind of went from there. The, the classic line that changes people's lives. <laughs> thought about recruitment. <laughs> well, exactly. I'm, I, I'm a saved accountant. Page they used to call them saved accountant. <laughs> and what, um, what, what type of business did Michael Page look like at that point in the, in the late 90s? So it was purely London based. Um, they were based in Parker Street, which is in Holborn. They were, uh, they, were, they, were, they were on two floors of a three floor building, three or four floor building. Um, there was about probably 70 of us, 80 of us, I think. Wow. It was pretty small. Mm. Um, and, and I, in fact, was in the team. I sat next to um, Steve Ingham, who is now the chief exec of. Uh, oh, wow. I sat next to his team. He was the manager of the marketing team and I was in the public sector team. Awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, it kind of, okay. it, it, all, it all grew from there. I, did, I didn't know, I didn't know what recruitment was, and, but I, I, I'm, you know, it's one of those sliding door moments. And yeah, I'm sure. It happened because it's, it's... How, how old was you at that point when you entered the... I was 24. 24, okay. Yeah. 24, end up in Michael Page, obviously huge brand. Um, and obviously ended up working there from what I can see online four years, real solid stint in terms of your first job in recruitment. Um, I mean, people, yeah. were, people have always said on this podcast that ended up at Michael Page or S3 or a business like that, that sort of the training, the environment that you get exposed to, um, the people that you meet have a real, end up having a real dramatic um, impact on sort of your career long term, sort of in, in hindsight. Yeah. So I guess sort of to, to sort of round up those first four years, how was it working for Michael I mean, Page? How were those first four years for you? Oh, it was tremendous. I mean, Page back then um, was, was, was a great company, and it still is probably, but, but certainly back then it was, um, it was fantastic. As a sportsman, um, we worked hard, we played hard, it was competitive. It was yeah. competitive internally, but in a, in a very positive way. It was definitely competitive externally. We, yeah, we wanted to beat the, the competition, which at those, back in those days was companies like Robert Walters and uh, mm. and all those sort of things, Hayes. Um, and the training was great. Um, uh, it was hard work. It was an eight to eight environment, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., Monday to Thursday. Yeah. Um, uh, and you were expected to be there and you were expected to be putting in the yards. But if you, 
if, if you were good at it and, um, and you worked hard, you got rewarded well. Um, and I made some cracking friends, which I still have today. I made some great contacts, people that I still talk to, um, rely on, uh, work with on occasions. Um, uh, you know, individuals that are actually, or an individual that have actually invested in me and human capital years later. Amazing. Um, it's, yeah, I was, I was so lucky. It was one of those moments. And, and Paige, a bit like S3 back in the day as well, Paige um, was a, uh, a hotbed of entrepreneurs. Yeah. So you can go back and look at the, you know, mm. yeah, we got hold of a telephone directory, you'd be able to see, oh, look, there's so, 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 yeah, so, yeah. so, so interesting. So, so. Well, um, so in your four years there, just quickly, did, did you just stay a, a sort of billing consultant or did you sort of become a leader? Did you get some leadership experience? No, I was a, I was a billing consultant. I did, okay. um, I, I did temps for two years and I did perms for two years. So okay. accountants into the public sector um, and then um, uh, perm, perm qualified accountants into industry and commerce companies in postcodes W2 to W14. Maybe. Okay, interesting. That that. Love that. Um, <laughs> And then, so how did you, why did you then start Human Capital? I mean, what, what, uh, yeah, what, what, where did that come from? How? Well, I, 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 well so I left Page very quickly. I left Page. Um, uh, I knew I wanted to do something slightly different. I, I was, I, I really enjoyed my time there, but I knew I didn't want to be part of the sort of the Page machine. Sure. Um, going forward, uh, for, or for too much longer. Um, I had a, I had a, I had a, a desire to, at that point in time, I had a desire to sort of try and find a work-life balance because I was really, you really were burning both ends of the candle. Um, and um, uh, my father actually had, had, was a, an independent, um, he'd worked for uh, London Business School um, and he was then independent. And he seemed to have a really nice lifestyle. He worked hard, but they had long holidays and all yeah, that yeah. sort of stuff. So I actually set myself up to train recruiters to be recruiters. Really? Um, yeah, so um, I did that for, I think, around about three or about three years. Wow. Um, and during that time, one, one, of, one of my clients had a change of management. And um, that management, that chief exec, bought in a, a, a dot-com business to this bricks and mortar recruitment company. Um, this was in the early 2000s, so it's the dot-com boom. And um, uh, he, actually, the chief exec, asked me to join him and again, it's one of those moments and it could only have happened in the dot-com boom. He asked me to come in and manage a, a, a floor of around about 100 recruiters. I had no <laughs> management experience. Whatsoever. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, but I was, um, oh, how old was I? I would have been, um, uh, I, page, I would have been about 30 odd. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, because I set up HC at 32. And um, uh, yeah, I, it was, it was it, they, they, they were crazy times, the dot-com boom. Everybody thought they were going to be a dot com billionaire, <laughs> and um, and we certainly thought we we sort of cracked it. We hadn't, um, but we learnt. I learnt an awful lot in doing that job, mm. um, and it's it's after doing that and and all the learning there, I I, I eventually decided that it, I probably wasn't the right guy to keep doing the job I was doing. So I but I, I knew I didn't want to go and work for another company. Yeah, I think that's the crucial crucial thing. I. I'd been my own boss with the training company. I'd kind of been my own boss or part of a very tight knit management team um, uh, with uh, yeah. with a dot com recruiter. Um, and I knew if I could, if, if I could, I really wanted to do my own thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You had a taste for it and it was like, yeah, there's no way that. Yeah. 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 Sure. That makes sense. And I, and I was very fortunate that. Um, uh, uh, one of my other clients, which is a company that became Hydrogen. Um, oh, wow. Uh, so got set up by Ian Temple and Chris Cole and financed by a chap called Charles Marshall. Um, the three of those guys invested in, <laughs> excuse me, they, they were a big client of mine at the training. training yeah, yeah. Um, and they invested in me to set up Human Capital. So they, they were my business angels. Um, wow. I, I, relatively speaking, I didn't have two coins to rub together <laughs> um, and um but they 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 saw some potential in me thank goodness and they agreed to provide me with um startup capital to 
um, to build the business. So did you so did you start just a bit of context then to help me and people listen to so did you start human capital on your own as a solo founder? Um, no, there was a chap that, that um, uh, I'd worked with at, um, at the dot com recruiter um, and I approached him and I said, look, I'm, I'm thinking of going down this route and I want to set up a, a, a recruitment business on my own. Would you like to join me? Um, yeah, if you do cut you in on the business, be great to work with you, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, the two of us, January, 2003, um, two of us sat in an office off, uh, off fleet street. There were a bunch of other people that were supposed to join us. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't, they didn't tell uh, my, my notice, my, uh, gardening leave was quite long. And, um, and by the time my gardening leave was over, these other people had found, all found other jobs. Oh, so it, was, yeah. it was literally just me and Nick sat opposite each other in, a, in, a, in an office for 12 and there was just two of us. So <laughs> first thing we did was renegotiate our lease. Um, <laughs> and then we set about trying to make some money. So just quickly then, what was the relationship with the investors? Was it, Justin, that we, we believe in you, we see you an opportunity, here's a real injection of cash to sort of catapult you and your plans? Or was it sort of obviously equity? Was it sort of financials and also advisory and potential mentorship and sort of advice or oh it's definitely the latter it's definitely that i mean the, the money was there um and they were very good at, at, at providing the finance to get us off the ground um but we were profitable within um within 12 months in fact at the end of, uh, we broke even at the end of 12 months and within in the second year we were we were turning a profit and we were cash positive um and in fact by the end of the second year we paid back the um, the loan, because it was actually a loan, it was a loan for equity um, deal. Um, we'd paid back the loan. Mm. Um, we hadn't so what, so what, how, do, how does that work? Sorry, so it was they lent you money in return for X percentage of the business. Yeah. And exactly, when yeah. you paid it back, what, that then reduced or did it stay the same? No, 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 it was no, just, no, oh, okay. No. They, kept, they kept their, uh, their cut, quite rightly. I mean, I, I, honestly, I mean, you know, I could not have done what I, what, what I, I could not have achieved what I achieved without um, their backing, both the financials in the early days, but actually their support um, and advice over the years. Mm. Now, the, yeah, Chris, Chris and Charles, Char, Charles had retired by that point um, and was living abroad. Um, uh, Ian and Ian uh, Temple and Chris Cole, um, they were building uh, what became Hydrogen. So in I had access to them and we talked relatively uh, frequently uh, to start off with, but actually as their business grew and my business grew, um, we spent less and less time together, but they were sure. always there to support. Yeah. Um, so ju just have been, have been all, all the way through. Just quickly, I mean, there's loads of companies out there now that invest in, that back people like Justin Pearson at the beginning of your journey. Just, just in hindsight, just quickly, why do you what why do you think they saw potential in you what did you demonstrate what sort of i don't know i'll be interested to sort of get your thoughts on that because i think that's something that i don't know people could get value or be interesting yeah. to know why you think um, people, why they thought you'd be a great person to be involved with um well i'd, I'd actually worked with chris at page so he knew me and the work okay. and then having trained their people for them uh, it was called finance professionals at the start having trained their guys for, for two, two and a half years, they kind of knew what work I did there. Um, so I think they, I think to answer your question, they, they knew me very well. Yeah. Trust as uh, trust does a good yeah. amount of trust. Yeah. They knew the quality of the work. They knew, they knew my, my values. They understood my values. They, mm. they were very aligned in the way we felt about not just business, but, but life itself. Um, and, um, you know, I think yeah, it, it 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 was still a big deal for them to 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 put their hands in their pockets and and because you know there's no guarantees, but um, I think that probably really helped in their decision. Um, yeah, sure. And um, yeah, I, th I think it's it's really it's really challenging if you if you're if you're an investor um, and you're looking for um, uh, finance. Um, my advice would be. Try and find finance from um, a, a source that can. If you're going to go to private individuals, private individuals that can actually add value to add value, yeah. your business as well, and rather than just an you. injection of cash, yeah, yeah, ra rather than just seeing you as a 
as a bit of a roulette wheel, um, actually they do want to get involved in your business. Mm, that's um, interesting. At, 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 at that startup end, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, it might change as you get bigger, but mm. um, at that startup end, actually having access to somebody who you know, has a vested interest in your business, a vested interest in it doing well, and has got experience um, that you can draw from, that's a, that's a real plus, I think. Mm. So I guess j- just for context then, Human capital. What what markets did you recruit in early on? What was the actual business itself? I'm sure that changed, but just it for did. context. Oh, it, it did. Okay. <laughs> so we started off. Um, uh, we started off recruiting in in risk. Um, so risk analysts and credit risk, market risk, etc. For financial institutions and, yeah. and, and, and companies like that. Um, but as as with um, yeah, in in many situations and. Uh, yeah, being being entrepreneurial minded, um, an opportunity arose with a client. Um, uh, this client was actually in the energy energy business, in the power and gas business. Yeah, the trader, power and gas trader. Um, and um, we got to know them, and they then said, "Look, can you recruit traders?" And I said, "Of course we can." <laughs> <laughs> Never done one before, but. Um, yeah, we can recruit, we can recruit anything. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you're looking for, we can find them. Um, and uh, they gave us the job. Um, I think they actually retained us, they gave us a small retainer fee up front as well. And um, and we just worked our backsides off to fill that job. Mm. We filled that job. Um, we then actually filled, uh, filled, we replaced the person we took out, we replaced that person with another person, and it, you know, but sort of the classic domino, sure. domino effect. Um, and then I turned around to, to, to uh, my business partner and said, look, I'm, I, I really enjoy this front office trading malarkey. Um, I'd like to concentrate on this. If you want to concentrate on the, on the middle office risk stuff, um, I'm going to concentrate on the trading stuff. And actually then a few months later, I said, look, I think we should actually just focus on power and gas or energy and energy trading and not work with banks in in FX or in whatever else. What sort, what sort of, what, just on that point, before we move on, what sort, mm-hmm. of mars, what sort of milestones did you hit for you to have confidence that it was actually a market that you wanted to dedicate all your resources to or focus on? It's a good question. I, I, I think what, what, I think in retrospect, and I think I thought this at the time, but I think in retrospect, I, it, it was all about the fact that um, here was a market that um, uh, was growing. So this was a market that was on on, on the up. Yeah. Um, the energy sector was was deregulating in Europe and also in the states. Um, these were uh, there were roles that um, where they were relatively junior individuals and quite a lot of them, but they were very highly paid mm. and there was a lot of demand. Um, it was also a tight market that you could get to know. You'd get your arms around quite quickly. quickly. Yeah. So that if you wanted to hire a gas trader, you had to go and find another gas trader. You couldn't take somebody from outside of gas trading. Oh, okay. So yeah. the, the candidate population was relatively small. Yeah. Um, and Pros and cons of that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, and, the and if you if you work really hard to wrap your arms around that and own the own, it's a, it's a big thing, big strategic thing for me is. Good recruiters, it's a, it's, I didn't invent this phrase, but good recruiters work tight markets. Good recruiters work tight markets. If you can put your cent- yourself at the centre, your company at the centre of a tight market, um, and you know the all the stakeholders, you have a relationship with all the stakeholders, the candidates, the clients, or sometimes they wear both hats, um, and you're seen as the conduit for um, recruitment, for hiring, for talent, um, then you know, you, you're in a very strong position, mm. um, and you don't need to be everything to all people. I think I think you know, some recruit, recruitment recruiters sort of have this idea that you know, you have to be able to provide all sorts of different services. Mm. Um, you know, pick one or two things and do them really, really well, and be known for doing them really, really well, mm. and that that will provide you with a very strong foundation to then build your business out from. So you've got really strong foundations and you can grow up. Otherwise, if you start, if you're, if you're, if you're sort of all over the place, you're going to be, mm. it's not, it's not going to so be. So how, how different is that to 
sort of really um, focusing on a niche, a niche niche, whatever you want to call it, the inch wide, mile deep. Is that oh, no, it's exactly so. there? So, yeah, okay, cool. The inch, go inch wide, mile deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's the opportunity that you recognise. So how many years was that in? Looking back. Uh, so at, at Human Capital, what whereabouts was this on the journey? Oh, that was you, about, that was probably by the end of year two. End of year two. End of year two. Okay, cool. Um, so obviously, yeah. so obviously achieved the the MBO in 2017. So let's just sort of break this down a bit. So maybe let's sort of break this down into maybe the first five years of HC. You just spoke about there where sort of two or so years in, you then found obviously the niche, a growing market and a tight market, as you said. Um, what? How did the business then evolve from that point? And what, what did the business end up looking like towards when we get to the sort of five year mark? Um, I guess what was going on and what the things look like. Yeah. So working a tight market, um, uh, the, the, the strategy that, 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 that I came up with was actually, um, if you work a tight market, you go into a company, an energy trading company, and, um, you start working for them in gas trading in London. So you're hiring gas traders, let's say. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you're inch wide, mile deep. So you, you're going into that. The company is the inch. You know, the, the inch you're going into this company and want to go mile deep into them. Okay, so nice. We then would look to uh, to recruit power traders, electricity traders, then oil traders, or whatever whatever other traders. So mm. at the trading level. So we never dropped below a certain level. Which and being a search firm, that was fee levels. Were, uh, we were never really went below sort of 35, 40. And most of our fees would have been in the 60, 70, 80 grand. Um, most of your fees? Yeah. Really? In that sort of area. Yeah. Very lucrative space. Wait, so what, so what was your average fee at that, fee at that point? Uh, it would have been probably around about 35, 40. Wow. Um, but um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it, but that's, that's, that, 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 that sort of um, was the level that we went in at. And then if you go into a company, say this energy trading company, um, we would... Uh, the strategy was to try and find as many of those types of roles, those that level of role as possible. Yeah. And um, by proving to the client that we were great at search, not great at finding gas traders, but great at search, they would then... What's the difference? Well, if, you, if you're great at finding gas traders, all you can do is find gas traders. So you've got a great roller decks of gas traders. And yeah. Okay. But, if you, if, but what, we, what we always aimed to do was we would say it was, our, it was our search process that found us the gas traders for you. It wasn't the fact that we've got this great Rolodex, although we do. Um, actually, we've developed this really strong professional recruitment process, which we can now apply. Oh, you need a, um, a you know a head of power trading. Um, we haven't got a background. We haven't got a Rolodex in power trading. Uh, but what we have is a proven um, methodology for finding these people, and you've, mm. you've benefited from that in this hire we did to over there. Now, would you? Would you, would you trust us to do this? Because in doing so, and this is what we did, we persuaded these companies to use us across their businesses. Mm. And then we developed that Rolodex of power traders. We then persuaded them to use us in oil trading. We developed that. Yeah, yeah. so this is the mile deep piece. And then, and then you're able to take that expertise and market it to, to other companies uh, that you are experts in gas, power, or yeah. whatever it might be. So we did that. We built... We built our capability in all the energy products in um, in Europe, in fact, because it was a Europe, not just London. Um, and then um, it, it wasn't consecutive, it, it, it blurred, but we then, right, okay, so you know, this company X, let's call it BP, okay. um, which has a big trading business. Um, you know, they, they obviously don't just operate in London, they operate in Chicago. They how can we, yeah, Chicago, how can we get involved with that? Singapore. So we then said, right, We'd love to do work for you in those locations too. Um, would you trust us to do a, an oil trading search in Houston? And because of the relationship that we built up with the business and the key hiring managers and the key decision influencers, HR, etc., and the fact that they saw us as, as problem solvers, as solution providers, not just brokers of CVs. Yeah. Um, they were they, they were comfortable in giving us a chance to show our capability in Houston. Yeah, and so we 
And how long did it take for you to just quickly on that a bit of a time scale? Uh, for within five, let me see, two thousand three. Yeah, within five years, we were in Houston and Singapore. Um, so, so we, what, what did you? So around what a year, eighteen months of sort of human capital being known as problem solvers delivering. Yeah. Then, then gave them confidence. Yeah. So we, that, so yeah. It, it, it all blurs into one. You know, yeah. So. Yeah. I can imagine. Um, uh, it, 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 essentially, what we did also is we we um, incubated those both the Singapore and the Houston business from London. From London, yeah. We yeah. were working on projects in um, Houston, for instance. Um, we had a small team. In fact, the, the guy that now owns the, uh, co-owns the, the business, he bought it out from me. Um, chap well, Paul Chapman. Um, he started like he's based in in Houston now. Um, he, he, he started with us in London. He uh, uh, set up or was part of the two, two guys worked from our London office for, I want to say, nine to 12 months, um, working Houston hours. Yeah, um, before they then, then they'd, they'd go over, there, over, they'd there, go over yeah. there for a week. But or Paul and I would go over there for a week. We'd do business development. We'd come back. We'd work those projects. He'd go over for another week. Then yeah. he'd go over for a fortnight. Then he'd go over for a month. And then okay. eventually he went over there permanently, but he had a, a, a book of business to go over with. Yeah, yeah. That's how we did it. We, 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 you go inch wide, mile deep. You find, yeah. you, find, you find something that you're excited and you're interested in. You find companies that, um, that you can work with. Um, and my advice would be you then grow to reflect the needs of those companies. Yeah. And, and then you try and pick companies if you have an ambition to go international. You pick companies that you try and find companies to work for that have international operations. Yeah. So um, what what I'm really interested to sort of dig a bit deeper on, Justin, is um, this the search piece that you're on about this that we were known as problem solvers, not just broker of CVs, right? Because mm-hmm. I think obviously now you doing what you do, I think recruiters that one are going to be build sustainable businesses are going to survive through this have to be known as more than that. Yeah. They have to be known as solutions, blah, blah, blah. So just like when you say we had a search process and we had the refined recruitment process and we were problem solvers, blah, blah, blah. I know I said, well, what's the difference? And you said it's having a roll of decks of this and, and these types of people. But when you actually talk about that, let's just like lift, like let's just actually say what you actually mean by that because I think that's just really beneficial because sometimes like when I hear, yeah, I work for a search firm over a recruitment agency, I'm like, okay, well, what's the difference? From yeah. my understanding conversations, it's things like, I don't know, like the actual setup where there'll be a team of researchers that do a certain part of the process and this is what they have to do and da 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 and then there's other people that just win business or whatever. But when you actually say around the solution and these types of things, what what does what did that actually look like? Because I think that'd be really useful for people to know because I think that's what people are gonna really be yeah. doing now. I, I think I think it's a mindset, Isham. I think it's um, okay. uh it's it, 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 it if you have the mindset that um excuse me that you're a recruitment expert yeah um almost like a recruitment doctor and <laughs> i've never had that before. <laughs> um and you, and you, yeah you're talking to a client and what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand what the issues are what the challenges are what the client wants yeah you haven't got your recruiter's hat on you're not you haven't got a sales hat on okay you've got a, you've got a, a, a consultative hat on Mm-hmm. And so you, you're simply trying to understand what it is they need, what it, why they need it, what they're trying to achieve, what good looks like, yeah, um, all this good stuff. And then actually, you're you're assimilating that information. You're taking you're taking board all that information, and you are able to then honestly advise them as to what is the right solution for that organisation with regards to finding the person they're looking to find. Okay, and that. You have to go into that that with the mindset that that might not be human capital, okay. And um, it, yeah, it might be that they need to use a methodology that just isn't the methodology that the human capital would use. They might it might be that actually they don't need to do a search. They should post an advert on LinkedIn, or they should um, uh, you know, go to a different recruitment firm, or they should do something else that's not yep. um, not what human capital would do best for them um too many recruiters 
at full full flat on their backs when um, they go and see a client and the client says, look, I need X. And the recruiter goes, mm, don't really know what that is. They've never done that. Um, but um, and I don't really know how to find that person. But give us a job. I'll do it. We'll give it a go. Um, and and they're desperate to get the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, everybody wants jobs. Everybody wants to have, have a job. I'd love it exclusively. I'd love it retained, whatever. You want the job. Well, I understand that. But the problem is, is that unless you're actually able to offer them the right solution and, and be able to deliver on that solution and be able to put, find the person they need, close that person, have that person start and to do a great job, actually, yeah, you, are, you are going to end up um, uh, screwing up that, that relationship with that potential client um, and never, you know, been not being able to work for them for maybe forever. Mm. Yeah, um, much better to go in there and actually listen to what they're saying, understand what they need, um, identify what the you know using your recruitment experience, your recruitment know how, identify the experience. Uh, sorry, the um, the solution that is actually the right solution for them, and then advise them. And if it's if it's you and your company, if it's human capital, fantastic, we'll do that job for you. But actually, if it's not, we'll point you, actually, we'll introduce you to the company that you should be using. Mm. And we took that approach and that approach paid and still does pay huge dividends. So when you say... You, you, sorry, to finish, you, you develop a partnership with your Yeah, client. totally. And this is everything that you always hear people talk about now and more recently, right? When exactly. you say solution, mm. what, like, I guess I'm just sort of just probing a bit here. Because it's like, okay, Justin, yeah, solution, I get that. But what, what, what can, when you say solution, what, how can it be more than me finding you the right person? Do you know what I mean? So what else was part of that solution that made it, do you know what I mean? Is it market mapping? I don't know. Is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, what, it's whatever is right for that client's needs. But what, that's so what I mean. At I think... Capital, we, had, we could do certain things. We could... Um, we, we, we could uh, draw upon our, our historical experience. So if, you know, if it was a role that we'd recruited before for a similar company in the recent year, we'd have, we'd have done the work. Yeah. So we would never say, oh, we'll go and do the research and, and charge you for that. Um, if we'd already done it, we'd say, look, actually, we've got this research done already. Okay. Um, so we don't need to do that. We can move more quickly than that. Um, or it would be um, actually we've got the international um, uh, capability. So a lot of the work that we did at Human Capital was actually moving people around internationally. Okay. These were specialist roles, and you you wouldn't just look in London for a London-based role. You might have to look in Houston or Singapore or sure. um, Hong Kong or wherever. So re relocating um, people. Yeah. Um, mm. So it, it 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 was it would be applying a consultative mindset. To it. Mm. So you, that's what I mean by coming up with solutions. Mm. If it was, if it turned out the role wasn't at the right level for us, or if it turned out the role was in a in a, a function that we just didn't have a capability in right now, and we didn't want to develop a capability in, um, you'd say no. Uh, we would we would we would say we're not the right people. If it didn't mm. fit our business strategy, we wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We wouldn't we wouldn't? Oh, we'll do it. Yeah, we'll we'll do it because you know. It'll keep the client happy, or we don't want anybody else to be doing work for this client. Um, we'll say yes to it. Um, yeah, in, there were times when we did in the early days, and that's how I learned not to do it. Was that what what happens is you end up you end up doing a half uh, you end up doing half a job. Yeah, you don't really want to do it. It's not in your wheelhouse. It's really hard work, and actually, you don't really want to spin the. The, the 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 research off and use it again you don't want to build sure, sure, sure. that function yeah so we, we yeah we, we learn to say no yeah and clients once you once you've said no to a client um no we can't do it we're not the right people you know you should talk to x the degree of trust in my experience goes through the roof elevates yeah oh it, it's you you have a different conversation because Unfortunately, as, uh, we, as recruiters, we do bear the scars as a as a as a group of 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 our uh, of people that have trodden before us. And yeah. unfortunately, recruit, recruitment consultants recruitment consultants don't always have the best of reputations. As of course, a group. and um, 
And if you can if you can differentiate yourself from the recruitment consultant that always says yes to a to a job but then does a poor uh, uh, gives poor service, um, uh, and and do that by actually being a, an honest advisor, um, that puts you well ahead of the game. Mm. And you know, coming on to to um, sort of post COVID and and the the, the 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 market that we're going to be facing. Uh, for most people in, in recruitment over the next few years, which is going to be a, a, a job short candidate long market. So not a lot of jobs and um, more candidate. candidates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it'll be the companies that have managed to develop that consultative approach with their clients that will be seen as trusted advisors. Yeah, for be, sure. Um, seen as, as solution providers that will be given priority. On yeah. The, Definitely. Because I think why, why I was just pushing you on the solutions part, Justin, is because there might be a lot of recruiters listening right now who think the only solution that they can, I know it's a mindset piece, but will make the decision in their head that the only solution that I can offer my clients is finding them developers in this certain, um, that have this certain skill set. Do you know what I mean? So I think that, that's why I was just probing you on that, because I think a lot of people make the decision, if that's the type of company they're in, or assume that the only solution I bring to the table as a recruiter is finding Justin the right person for this job. Yeah. That's the only solution I bring. And, and yeah, obviously I, I have loads of conversations. You hear a lot more now about productization, having different types of solutions. And I think sort of this current period right now has probably pushed that on a lot of people as well. Um, so I guess that, that's why I was just probing you on that. Cause I think it's, it's, it's good that you're talking about that and, I think a lot of people have the mindset that the only solution I have and bring to the table is this, which is, is, is that I know. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. No, I, th I, I think you're right. I th I, my advice would be, um, you know, if, well, if, if you haven't got this capability already, it's going to be difficult to, but m a lot of recruitment consultants are actually solution provider, solution providers without realizing it. It's about, it's about the individual, the company's recruitment methodology. It's about how how do you how do you um, fill a job? Um, yeah. If all you know how to do is um, take a job spec from a client, um, tick a few boxes, stick that on on a on a, um, a website, and then you know, match match CVs to job spec like that, yeah, then I'm afraid you're you're, you're going to be really challenged going forward because you're adding no value to yeah to to to, to the world. Uh, of recruitment and actually even without covid your your job was going to disappear in, in very short yeah. because you know, computers can do that they can they've done it they do it to a point now ai you know if you can't if you can't add value over and above just the objective matching of cvs and job specs then you you you're, uh, unfortunately you're going to be dead in the water okay. um, you've so got to be able to add something more than that so just quickly before we move on just really simply what can that be then? <laughs> just, just like, because I think it's just important just to make it really clear. Is that, as I said, market mapping? Is that uh, giving a client an actual, um, uh, an opinion on what people think of their business? Um, I don't know. What actual things can I do as a recruiter that isn't just that? Just I think really you, you mentioned it there. Have an opinion. Okay. Advise your client. Your client says, I need X. Don't just shake your head and say, I'll go and find you X and toddle off. Um, have a think about why do you want X? What are you trying to achieve? Why, why are you looking for that particular developer? Why are you looking for that particular uh, skill set? What, wh where does this all fit in? Um, what have you done so far? Um, why has that failed? Why are you recruiting this position? Um, ask all those questions, understand the situation, and then advise them on the best way to do it, to find this person, to, to, mm -hmm. or advise them that actually this person doesn't exist. If they don't exist, tell them. Uh, you know, have the courage of your convictions. You are an expert. You are there, and your client wants you to provide them with a solution. They don't want you to provide you provide them with just CVs. They want a solution. They want direction. They want advice. They want to save time. They want to save money. They want to hire the, the best people and the right people. Um, and if all you do is phone them up, say, got any jobs, they say, hopefully, yes. You say, what do they need? Bop, 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 bop. And you go away. You know, you're, you're just a broker. You're adding almost no value in my opinion to, to, 
to the recruitment process. Okay. Um, uh, and um, in, a, in, a, in a job short uh, candidate long market, you're going to be finding it very, very difficult to differentiate yourself. Yeah, agreed. And for, for uh, clients to want to come to you rather than to mm. whoever else they talk to as well. Okay. Okay. Have so, opinion is, the, is the answer. <laughs> so back to sort of the human capital journey then. How did this mindset, how did this process, obviously you spoke a bit about how it gave you international opportunities and sort of the, the people that early early um early on involved in that that now obviously own um um human capital but how did then this actually impact you growing this recruitment business if you could talk a bit about that that'd be interesting how did this then enable you to scale the actual business itself um well i mean the, the again it, scaling the business was about um uh if, it, eventually it was about reflecting the needs of our client base yeah, yeah. So you said that, didn't you? So we always, we, the, the human capital has always grown, success, successfully grown by organically through reflecting the needs of clients. So, and clients, clients don't always have exactly the same needs as each other. So you might work for um, BP, which is predominantly you know, an oil company, um, uh, but they have a small gas and power business or small LNG business, for instance. Um, and you do some work for them in the LNG space, which allows you to then go and build, okay, you build a capability in the LNG space, which you then go and take to companies that only do LNG or companies that do LNG, but also liquid natural, natural gas, or, but also coal. Yeah. You go in there and, and, and you, you grow organically. You, yeah, you, yeah. you always go from known to unknown. You don't do too much. So it's, it's about just w working your way through a particular space. Mm. Then you've got, it's 3D um, model, so it's a matrix. So then you've got, you've got, cap you've got um, sector or product, um, then you've got geography, and then you've got function. So... Um, so function's the coal. Function being the, the energy. Role, no, the roles, yeah. So yeah, it was traders, but then it was also... Um, uh, marketers and sales salespeople. Then it was um, middle office staff, so it was accountants, um, IT people, uh, so technologists, analysts, um, uh, HR specialists. Yeah. All the, these are all people that work in this particular sector, which was the energy and natural resource sector. So we mm. focused purely. We never stepped out of that. We, 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 and I don't, I don't think the company will ever step out of that. It, it's about just being in one particular sector and, and in energy and natural resources, because it's such a big space, focusing on one particular part of that, which is um, uh, the, uh, the, the middle and downstream part of it. So human capital doesn't do anything in the upstream. It doesn't recruit people that wear hard hats and carry spans. Yeah. Um, it's just the people at the, at the, who get it from the beach to um the shore and then from the shore to the customer so to the yeah the, the people that drive their cars or the or the the the, you know, the 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 shipping companies or the airlines or whatever um and um so yes yeah, so, so i think yeah to, sorry to it, the the trick the trick i think is looking at what you've got and thinking right how can we maximize the return here on what we've already got with this particular client what else do they do that we could do for them that we could spin out and increase and, and in doing so increase the capability of our business which we can then market to other companies which we can then use to grow our capability again and again and again and again yeah and then you take it you look at you know, you, you, you have an international element to that which allows you to, to expand as well um and then you actually have a functional element to that because i think a lot of people get i think a lot of people when they think of growth they think it they think about it the other way they think about it that i need to get new clients new business oh no yeah that's, that's what i mean because that's what you're talking about isn't it yeah i mean it, my whole the whole strategy um and i know you share this thought this this way of thinking as well the whole strategy it's far easier to get more business from an existing client than it is to break into a new client yeah so maximize the return on what you've got right now uh, what you what you have access to if you've built a great relationship with an organization 
what else can you do with for them? Because the, if, as long as they know you to be a great recruiter and not just the guy that is great at finding X, Y, Z developers, but they actually think this guy actually knows how to find people. It doesn't matter what kind of people mm. they are. So if, if you've got, if you've developed that kind of um, reputation and you're known as that solution provider, um, as that recruitment expert, um, then use that to drive deeper and deeper into, into the company. Yeah. That what you then create is a capability in other functions, other areas of that business, um, other roles, other maybe locations, which you can then spin out to other companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. So totally capability in one company or a couple of companies and then spin it out. Mm. Trying to, um, and there are lots of companies out there that, that, that do this, but it's such hard work to, um, you know, what we used to call churn and burn. So, you know, phone a client, win a job, fill a job, move on. Yeah. Find another client, um, find another client, find another client. You know, because you're, you're constantly having to try and develop relationships. It takes a long time to develop good relationships. Mm. Um, okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a great believer in, again, it's that inch wide, mile deep. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that what you said about known into the unknown, known into the unknown. I think that's that's really cool. But I wanted you to talk about that because I think a lot of people do get caught in that, don't they? That I build 250k this year and my target next year is to do 350. Automatically, recruiters think that okay, that means I need 10 new clients that pay me this, rather than okay, well, I made 50k out of this relationship. Can I make that into another hundred? Yeah, do you know what I mean? Because I think because I yeah, love the way that's, you that, that. The, 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 yeah. You that 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 in my opinion is the way to build a strong portfolio as an individual recruiter, um, and it is the way ultimately that that you build strong recruitment companies. Mm. Uh, it, uh, yeah, it's not about how many. It, it, for me, when I go and see a, um, uh, a company, you know, one of the questions I ask is, you know, how, how many how many uh, projects did you work on last year, and uh, and for how many clients. Um, and the companies that say, you know, we did 1,500 placements for 1,500 companies, I think, my God, your people must be absolutely knackered. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is so hard. If they say, look, we filled 1,500 jobs for 500 companies, that's pretty good. I, I'd be looking at it. I, I, I'd be looking at them saying, right, well, the good stuff about 1,500 jobs for 1,500 companies is imagine what if you've just got one extra job with each of those companies. Yeah, yeah. Two jobs of fifteen hundred companies, three thousand jobs. Yeah. Let's try and get five out of out of fifteen hundred. Mm. Seven seven thousand five hundred jobs. It, yeah, it 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 um you don't need to go and win lots of new clients. Mm. You need to win some and you need to be able to uh, have a have a flow of new clients coming through because if it, it, yeah life is life companies will stop being clients for whatever reason there might not be probably will be nothing to do with your business it's just that yeah they'll change they'll move they'll whatever mm. um uh yeah rpo will come in and take over whatever um but um yeah but you don't you, you it should it shouldn't be that you're churning clients every mm. um uh yeah, every, every year so when when did you start keen to obviously dig a bit more into obviously Hive and what you do now, which is sort of what you're touching on there, but yeah. just to sort of segue into like when when did you and your business partner actually start thinking this is actually a business that we could sell or exit? Because obviously you obviously I think obviously more back in the day, way before I was in recruitment, the, the typical mindset was yeah, I'm gonna start a recruitment business and sell it. I think some people still think that that I can achieve that in this obviously, but there's a lot of things that people don't understand mm. or realize. So I guess when, like at what part of the journey did you actually start thinking and recognize, well, actually what we're building here is actually something that um, has got great equity value and is something that we could sell. Where, where was that on the timeline? Um, if there was a moment, it was, I don't it, know. It was, it was actually uh, very close to the beginning. Really? Um, Yes, because I'd worked in other companies, and w when I set up HC, I I knew that I wanted to build something that wasn't Justin Pearson Limited. Um, yeah. It wasn't about me. Yeah. I knew I was going to be important to the business to start off with because I was, you know, the only employee to start off with. But <laughs> um, yeah, if 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 the company was to have a value um, 
other than the, the, just simply the fees we made and the, and the profit we made. Um, so if it was to have equity value, um, if my shareholding was to be worth anything, it had to be more than me. Yeah. I, 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 I knew from the beginning that I needed to build something that... that wasn't uh, relying on Justin Pearson. Yeah, wasn't ultimately relying, reliant on me. Um, and that had a brand value of its own, that had its own brand, that had its own, that had its own life. Um, and I didn't know where that would end. I think if you asked me when I first started it, I'd have said, yeah, I want to sell it to something. As every recruiter does when they start a new, new business. Um, yeah, I'm going to sell it. Um, I'll sell it to who you going to If somebody asked me, who are you going to sell it to? I'll say, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> but I, I really want to sell it. Um, but I, I, but I, I actually did want to sell it, but I just didn't know how I was going to sell it. But I did know somebody else would want to buy because all I did was think, well, what kind of company would I want to buy? Well, you know, nothing, but I'd want to buy a company that um, you know had a great database where everybody used the database. That's obviously important. Um, I'd want to buy a company that was really well run, that. Um, you know, had systems and processes, had accountants, had a marketing strategy and plan, had technology, had all that sort of stuff. I'd want to, I'd want to, I'd want to, I'd want to um, buy a business that the minute I bought it, all the staff didn't walk out and go and work for themselves. You know, where staff were loyal, where they were, where they wanted to, to, to be part of the company that had a strong culture, that had strong retention, had a good people plan. Um, so I knew all of that stuff instinctively. Um, I think I think what you just said there though is, and I'm sure this is something that you ask people now. But what a great question that is! Yeah. What what type of recruitment business would I want to buy? Yeah. And yeah. everything that you just reeled off there, then cultivates the actions that you take and what yeah. you want to build, right? But I think everything that you just reeled off there are great. Instead of saying, "Yeah, I want to obviously sell this business," is the right the correct question is actually, "What type of recruitment business would I want to buy?" And then yeah, it's, yeah, it, totally. yeah. So that. Totally. that so well, how if, if you want to sell your business, let's say you want to sell your business for a million quid, 10 million quid, whatever, 20, 24, 30, whatever, you know, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Selling your business, selling your business for a hundred thousand pounds, hundred thousand pounds is still a lot of money. Yeah. You know, if you think it, if, if you want to say that it isn't, I'll you know, lend me a hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> Great. If, you, if it means something to you. Um, you know, so for somebody to part with their company for your business, you know, it's got to be worth it's got to be worth something and it's got to be it's got to have it can't just fall apart the minute i i take it yeah yeah so what so what was how long then with that i love that i think that's great and we'll get people thinking how long was that sort of journey then to the point where then there was people that wanted to buy uh, you guys out wanted to own the human capital how long was that process roughly well we we we, we there were uh, along the way um so I, 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 like many people, started off thinking that perhaps there'll be companies that might want to buy human capital in the, in yeah. the future. Um, and through a series of conversations and just, just, uh, well, yeah, just, just research and talking to people, I realized that actually for a, for a search firm, um, it's quite difficult to sell a search firm um, because the perception is that um, the equity value of that business goes up and down in the lift. That actually the the value of a search firm is the search consultants and the people, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which, yeah, uh, uh, to a degree, any recruitment business, any is. Yeah, of course, of course. But if you're if you're building a recruitment business, my advice is, it's really important to have great people, but it's absolutely imperative to have great systems, processes, database, technology, brand. Because yeah. your people will change, and if if you if you are only selling the people then your, the value you get will be much less. Mm. Because um, you know, recruitment buyers, whoever they may be, if it's private equity or lending money to the management team that's gonna take over from you, buy the company from you, or if it's a, another company, they're not silly, they're not stupid. Um, mm. if, they, if they think for a second that there's nothing holding this together but sticky tape and string, um, they're not going to they're not not gonna part, yeah. a part of their money. So, so that, that then made you look at the other options, which was? Well, you know, it, it made me realize that, that um, uh, actually the chances of a trade sale were going to be quite slim. Also, what was involved in a trade sale was uh, not something that I was really that enthused by. 
Yeah. Okay. Trade sales. I haven't come across one in many years now that doesn't involve this. Trade sales in, in involve what's called an earn out. So you don't just sell your company and to a third party and walk away. Um, it's not like selling a car. Um, you have to stay the there. The deal is you stay there. You don't get all of your money up front. It's, it's basically Until you hit certain, yeah. It's basically a try before you buy, which is to avoid the, the problem of yeah, the, the risk that and then everybody walking out the next day. Um, so you, yeah, you're, you're normally locked in for two or three years post that. Um, and that, that, again, that kind of spoke to me about actually I'd end up having an, uh, another boss. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and actually, but yeah, it, it, ultimately it just wasn't going to, I didn't think it was going to be an, an option for us anyway. So I looked at what were the other options and, and the vast majority of businesses will be able to, well, most recruitment businesses never get sold. So let's start there. Yeah. Um, they never get to the point where they have an equity value. They never get to the point where um, uh, anybody would actually be interested in, in, in paying money to, 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 um, to buy the business. Um, so, yeah, a lot of businesses don't achieve that. But those that do, usually, actually, it's through a form of management buyout. It's, it's through the founder, the owners, or the owner, um, selling the business to the, the management team below them. Um, the next generation. The next generation. And generally, the next generation will do the same and do the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's financed by private equity. Sometimes it might be financed through debt. Sometimes it might be financed through um, the cash flows of the business. Okay. There's ways to finance it but, yeah, and the individuals themselves, but ultimately they're internal deals that happen. Mm. Um, and so, go on, sorry. I was just going to say two key things on this that I'd love to know, and then let's let's dig into Hive. Two cool. key things. First one: common misconceptions people have on management buyouts. Yeah. Second one, um, key sort of if I if I'm listening right now, I'm thinking actually this makes sense long term. Yeah, I think I can achieve a management buyout. What what sort of things do I need to start getting in order to achieve that? So I guess just key key parts of that journey that sort of you did and or learn through doing that that are really important to make that a su successful exit. So common misconceptions and sort of the key parts that enable that to happen. Yeah, I think um, common misconceptions or, or misunderstandings are around um, what is a management buyout for starters um, and, and, and what does it entail? And I think a lot, a lot of, you know, what you look at is whatever happens, so you want somebody to buy your company. Now, if it's the management team, um, in some respects, that should be easy because they're part of it. They're, they, you know, they can see the value of it. They can, um, yeah, there's, uh, trust, there's trust there, and they know what yeah, they're buying, yeah. and da, da, da. Well, that's good stuff. But when it comes push comes to shove, they're going to either have to borrow the money to do that, or they're going to have to, you know, finance it themselves um, through their own savings or whatever. Mm. Um, and that's when it becomes um, actually it becomes real. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, it's a big, big step for people to do that. Um, uh, for people to, because even in a private equity deal, there's going, they're going to ask the management team that buys that, that they're financing, that they're supporting. Private equity is, is they're just simply lending you money. It's just very expensive money. Um, and they're lending it to the management team to buy out the current owners. Yeah. Um, and that, that private equity business is going to want to know that the uh, the company that they're lending this money to is a well-run company. Yeah. So as an owner, irrespective of whether you're going to sell it to another company, you're going to sell it to the management team, or you're just going to run it for cash forever, um, you want that business to be as well-run as it possibly could be. Um, and I think what, what people don't understand necessarily, and this is the misconception, is how you value a company. A recruitment a recruitment company. So you, the valuation of a recruitment company is typically um, a multiple of profit of EBIT or EBITDA or whatever, whatever, whatever whichever uh, 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 description of profit you want to use, but it's typically a multiple. So it's a number times 
the profit that the company makes over a three year period, average yeah. over a three year period. That's typically the formula. It, it, obviously, there are many, many ways to do it, but that was a good way to start is thinking like that. So, um, in order to increase the value of your company um, and to, to make more money from the sale of it, um, you, you definitely want to work on both improving the profitability of that company, the, the quantum of profit, but also you want to play around with that multiple. You want to improve that multiple. And the example I would give to anybody is, look, if you've got a company that's making a million pounds profit a year, yeah, um, and you want to sell it, if, you, if your company can only attract a multiple of two, you'll make two million pounds. You don't have to mess around with the EBIT number anymore if you can move your multiple from two to three or from two to four, two to five. Um, obviously, because you know, two times one is two, but if you move it three, if you double your multiple, you go from two million to four million. And then you've got to understand what... Um, what impacts the what, multiple. What drives the multiple. And many, many things drive the multiple. Um, almost none of them are to do with whether you're great recruiters or not. <laughs> um, they're, due to, they're, they're all down to how well run. Yeah, so it's down to the questions you earlier said. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I, I, re I realized that pretty, pretty quickly. And, um, and actually, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, even if I hadn't realized that, it just wouldn't have computed not to have built a business that had strong foundations and strong systems, strong structures, strong processes. Mm. Because as your business scales, if you don't have those in place, you start making mistakes, you start losing money, you start... Yeah, losing, yeah. Start and, I know, and I know this is something that you now help recruitment business owners with, right? Yeah. So final thing, just a bit conscious of time. I know we've got like sort of, what, 15 minutes or so, yeah? Um, just a final thing on that, to tie that all together, what for you has been the sort of biggest positive out of going the MBO route as a recruitment business owner, what ended up, what do you sort of think has been the best, rather than having this dream and ambition of selling it externally, whatever, but for you personally, what's been the biggest positive out of going down that route? Well, um, it's a good question. Um, there's a number of different things there. there there's, there's actually the, the financials of it, um, are important and, and were important, but actually, and this is going to sound maybe sound maybe sound a bit sort of um, uh, a bit sort of odd, but uh, being able to to work with a group of people and, and with two individuals in particular who um, who I had worked with ever since they joined the business graduate trainees, yeah, um, to have worked with Damien and Paul um, over fifteen years. And have talked about obviously over that fifteen year period about the opportunity for them to take over the business. Yeah. Um, having been there as they um, they married, they <laughs> kids, you know, they've been yeah, through yeah. them as they as they built businesses, both them Paul in Houston, Damon in Singapore, and Natalie London. Um, as they built th their whole lives, to be able to work with them to build something that has real value and then to be able to pass that over to them um for them now to take on they're in their their early 40s late 30s early 40s they now own that business um or the vast majority I think they own about 90 percent of it um uh yeah that's theirs now to take to the next level yeah um and that yeah you can't that, put a price on that yeah, that's, well, that's, that's, that's a really important thing. Just for me personally, I, you know, some people... Yeah, no, I love that. ...walk away, but... Um, I'm, 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 and I continue to support them um, and, and will do for forever and a day. But, yeah, um, that's amazing. So there, was, there, there, was, there was that side of it. And then the other side of it is going down the mansion buyout route, um, you do have a lot more control as the founder, as the owner, as the CEO, if you're operational. You do have a lot more control on... Um, how that how the MBO ha actually works and and mm. uh, and on um, on actually making it happen, but also on uh, the timing of it, the valuation, etc. And actually, that's not to say that you can uh, you you probably will get more. You probably would make more on the valuation if you sold it to a third party, possibly. 
Yeah. Um, you know, typically, uh, you know, you, uh, an MBA might might be not not quite the, the most lucrative way to go, but actually, what I felt when I did when I did the MBA at, at, at HC um, was that um, we were in it together, and it was a positive experience, and we all wanted the deal to happen, but we wanted to do it in a way that was the right for the company and right for the, right for the employees, but also right for the, the exiting owner and the incoming owners. Yeah. Um, awesome. And yeah, I think it was, a, it was, it was a tremendous experience um, overall. And, you know, yeah. it, it's been, I, I, I would highly recommend it. And um, yeah, for any, of, any of, any of your subscribers that, um, uh, yeah, that have ambitions to to build something and and to own their own business. Um, I said, go for it. Yeah, it's yeah, it is. My goodness, is it tiring and stressful, <laughs> and but it's super enjoyable. Yeah. Um, and and if you if you're of the right mindset, um, yeah, owning owning your own business, owning your own recruitment business can be so rewarding, not just financially, but also in in many other ways. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really grateful to to Kirsty, the recruiter at Michael Page, that <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Me for, saved me from a life of accountancy. <laughs> <laughs> put, me um, the, put me on the track of uh, of being a recruitment consultant. So look then, Justin, before we finish, just just really keen to talk about Hive, which I think ties in, obviously into this really nicely in the journey yeah. that you've been on. Obviously, obviously, so X to that business. I know, obviously, when we spoke. There's just an element of like, right, what next? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then obviously for, I mean, it looks like obviously coming towards a year now, you've you started um, another business called Hive, which as I said in the introduction, all about helping working with recruitment business owners, recruitment entrepreneurs on actually helping them scale their business and building up the equity value, which is what you're just talking about there, increasing that multiple, yeah. increasing profit. Um so that's what you've been up to over the sort of nearly a year now. I guess before we finish, what, what I'd love you to just share, because now you've got this interesting perspective of working with different recruitment businesses and business owners. What, what, are, what, have, been, what have been the most common pitfalls or common um, things that have held recruitment business owners back on building their equity value, would you say? Um, uh, crikey, that's a, that's a, that's a big question in some respects. Um, <laughs> if I was to choose, I, I think, I think if I was to choose one, um, one challenge that, that, uh, business owners, the founders of uh, yeah, startups, um, yeah. face is, um, is, is the fact that when, when you start a business up, you are obviously as the founder, you're going to be crucial to its success. Yes, um, you pro- you probably do everything. You probably you probably bring client relationships with you. You probably bring candidate relationships with you. Um, make the coffees. You make the coffees. You're probably, <laughs> the, you're probably the best person to go and win business. The best person to direct, etc. Um, and many businesses uh, never actually get beyond that. Never get beyond yeah. the fact that the owner is the person. If the owner isn't there, things don't happen. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that is actually down to the owners themselves not being able to give up their responsibilities, their role in their client relationships, not being able to give up client relationships, not being able to give up responsibility for making decisions about the coffee, the tea, the yeah. on the wall, the computers you use, the, yeah, everything has to flow through the owner. Yeah. And ultimately that owner becomes the block themselves. Um, the bottleneck. The bottleneck, yeah. They, 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 the, uh, my advice would be watch out for um, a situation where actually look around you and, and there's nobody, nobody in your team in your business that's challenging you. Mm. You want to hire people that are better than you, hire people that are better at, at, kind of, at client relationships, kind of, you know, client development, hire people that are better at um, uh, delivery. Um, do you think recruitment business owners want to do that? Uh, no, because I think there's a there's a real fear. I think I think it's, I think some the, the enlightened ones do. I think and, and I think some learn to, and I think a lot don't. 
because um, they are fearful of giving people responsibility, giving people uh, uh, seniority, giving people opportunity, and then those people leaving and going into competition with them. Yeah. Because that's what they did. Yeah. They don't want to create another situation that they actually were part of previously. And they don't. So I think there is this, uh, I think a, a lot of recruiters who set up recruitment businesses, their recruitment businesses never get any bigger than themselves and a few other people who change constantly um, because those, those owners never give up the, 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 never give, never give their employees the opportunity to grow, develop and build a business themselves. Mm. Um, they hold all the relationships. So for instance, the obvious one is the client relationships. Yeah. And if you do that, then why would good recruiters stay? They might join you, but why would they stay with you? Yeah. Because, you know, you're, you're not giving anything up. I think my, my experience, my learning is if you're, if you're going to start a recruitment business, you want to look to make yourself redundant from your role on a regular basis. You know, pass that responsibility onto somebody else. You know, if, if, you, if, you were the, if you're the key guy on the, the five key relationships, if you're the main guy on five key relationships in the business, how do you give those relationships to other people? So that mm. you can go away and build another five relationships. Or you know, so you can go away and build a business over here or do this or do that. You, you've got to give it away, make yourself redundant from that and pass it on and then build the culture of that. So the person you give it to, they then build, they, they work those relationships for a couple of years and they're looking to pass them on to somebody else so they can do something else. Yeah. So it's, it's I think that the, the, that's, that's probably the biggest challenge most recruiters. So has that been sort of one of the most common pieces of advice that you have found yourself giving then like you really cultivating these people to have the mindset of finding constantly finding things to make themselves redundant from yes yes it's, it's it's challenging it's challenging owners um why are you doing that why are you still doing that who could do that who could do that better um why are you still doing you know why why are you still handling client relationships yeah yeah, you you yeah, if you want to build a business that you can sell at some point, those clients can't be buying from Justin Pearson Limited. They should be buying from Human Capital. They should be buying from mm. XYZ company. Do you um, need to do you need to know that you want to scale your business from the very start to successfully scale it, do you think? Um well, I think most people start a recruitment business because they look at the business they're working for at the moment and they think I'm making a lot of money for this company, but I'm only getting X. I'm making yeah. a lot, I'm only getting X. Yeah, I think that's, that drives a lot of people to start off with. Um, you know, what what does my current employer give me? You know, I don't think he gives me anything. Therefore, I'm going to go and do it myself. So I don't I don't think people necessarily most people start a recruitment as thinking I want to grow it. Yeah, or beyond you know the normal. Yes, of course I want to grow. Yeah, it, so. yeah. Um, but. Um, uh, I think, I think there is, if, if, if you're asking, is there a timeline? Is there, is there a curve? Yes, I think there is. I think the longer you leave it, the longer it is a... Um, uh, Isn't this yeah, just around you? It's just in Pearson Limited. The harder it gets to change the culture of the business. Yeah. To become something that is you, where you're able to, 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 to move in the direction of growing empty value. Um, Interesting. So yeah, I, th I think you've got to have, I think, I think sort of, yeah probably five years is probably the time if you haven't thought about it and you want to grow something sort of a now or never uh, yeah five years in and then it's going to be really hard it's not impossible but it's but be yeah so, so just quickly justin before we finish interesting to get your thoughts on what the future recruitment business looks like i mean i'm sure you've looked at the stats as you looked at hive and everything but there's various stats out there but easily circa 30,000 recruitment businesses in the UK um the stats that I've looked at anywhere between the sort of 80 80 ish percent of sort of micro businesses higher up to nine people yeah the next sort of banding up is then obviously um uh, 10 to 50 not a, again a huge percentage and then obviously it keeps going up so I guess with everything that's gone on and everything how do you think 
that what does the future recruitment business look like? Does it is it a business that scales to 40, 50 heads and achieves an MBO, or is it actually more niche, even more niche, lean recruitment businesses um, that have great people in there that are great at what they do, but it's more lucrative? I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I think because I yeah, think I, like, I I have to say I honestly don't know. Yeah, fair enough. I think I think if, I think if you are asking about the impact of technology um, yeah. on recruitment. I think recruitment te- technology will change the role of the recruitment consultant over time. I think you'll see um, uh, where where recruitment is is effectively one dimensional, where it where it is a body type thing. We need you know we need a we need 10 people to go and stack shelves. Um, I think that's increasingly will be done just automatically through technology. Um, yeah. And I think that recruitment consultants will need to, to recruitment consultancy will continue to exist, but I think it will become more and more about the added value element of recruitment. Yeah, the solution. And... Yeah, it's about solutions, it's about all that sort of good stuff. Mm. I, think, I think technology will change stuff and it will change the role of the recruiter. Um, for the better, in fact, I think I think it will it will make recruiters um, become more consultative and more advisory in the way that they operate, not less. Um, what around size? Um, I, I don't no, know. That's not always the best measure, but I yeah. think typically you typically. I mean, it's the first question you get as a business owner: How many people have you? Are how many people do you have, Justin? Or how many people in the mm-hmm. business? And also, I think it's typically been associated with a successfully a successful growing recruitment business. Get five, yeah. get no, five I've, grads I've in. Bought, yeah, I've, I've never bought into that um, because it, 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 it's it's bloody easy to, to hire. You know, I, you meet people and they say, "Oh, I've got a, um, you know, when I used to meet competitors or, or other companies when I was a CEO, um, and and you know, you're sort of comparing, and there's, you know, we're a hundred man firm, we're hundred firm." And, and, Fantastic! I, uh, you know, I can build a hundred-man firm tomorrow. I can hire a hundred people. Whether they'll make any money, and whether we're around the day after. <laughs> is the um, for me, it's not about headcount. It's about productivity. Um, productivity. And, yeah, the best company to own is one where you've got the highest pro- productivity per head. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's if it's five people, it's ten people, fifty people, five hundred people. Um, it's, it's all about the productivity per head. And then, actually, and is that just billings you referring to, or actually? Um, different well, productivity would, for me, means profitability per head. Profitability, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I, I think I would never get. I, I'd advise people don't don't get sucked into thinking that success is hiring is having more people on desks or having international offices um, or having offices all over the country. Um, it's far easier to manage fewer people than more people. Um, it's far easier to manage and build a company if they're all sat in the same location. Um, trying to run a business that is all over the world is a bloody nightmare um, because yeah, you've got time yeah, just time zones, logistics. Yeah, trying to build a company culture across different um, countries very difficult. You know, so I, I think hats off if you can do it. Um, but you know, my advice to, to young entrepreneurs would be don't judge success on the number of people that you have in the office or in the company or, or the number of um, locations you work from or countries you're in. Um, judge it on um, how productive your, your business is, um, uh, how stable it is, how respected it is both, both by clients, candidates and by, by employees. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Don't don't get don't get sucked into my 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 headcount's bigger than your headcount. Yeah. <laughs> um, so look, before we finish, then what what are you excited about with Hive? Then obviously, early on 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 the journey, what um what are you most excited about with it? How? Yeah. Anything you want to shout about? Um, I think I think the exciting thing at the moment is. Uh, is the fact that for me personally is the fact that I am meeting um, so many interesting people, um, both company owners, but also um, the experts um, that we, that we employ as Hive, the, 
um, the, our associate base, you know, the, the, the experts in board advisory, the experts in marketing technology, uh, all these people that are part of the Hive business and who work with our clients to build their businesses. Because it's not just me. Um, you know, there, there are uh, you know, an increasing number of us who are actually there providing services to clients. Uh, but actually, what I'm doing is, is I'm, I'm just meeting a lot of company owners. And that's fascinating. Learning yeah. about how they do things, learning about their companies, what's good, what's not so good, what their, what their challenges are. And then meeting these experts. I mean, yourself, yeah, we didn't know each other. No, yeah. Until, uh, until a few Yeah, no, that must be really fun for you, obviously. So, um, uh, and just, yeah, getting different out people. And, and learning, and learning all this new stuff that's out there. Yeah. Um, and then being able to make a difference. Yeah. Um, to, um, see businesses that we are involved with actually evolving um, and, uh, and growing or dealing with COVID as, as, as we've had to help out as well and getting through that, um, you know, dealing with uncertainty, dealing with um, some really strange times. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very rewarding um, to be able to do that um, and, and really, really enjoyable. Oh, that's awesome. That's wicked yeah, as well. That's that's why I'm excited for the future. Yeah, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be hard out there. That's not that's not really about a bush. And there are there are some advisors out there that still seem to be sort of banging the drum that this will be all over by Christmas. Um, yeah, it's not. It's going to be very challenging for 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 any type of business over over the next few years. Um, but you know what? It's it's. The challenge we can meet those challenges, and recruitment companies can still be successful in recessionary markets. Um, and a, a recessionary market is great because it gets you really, really fit. Yeah, and markets do come back. And when those uh, the companies that that really push hard to get fit and strong and healthy for this next few years that we're going to go through, they will find themselves really well positioned when the market ticks back up again and it will do i've worked mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a bit older than you and I've, wor I've worked through you know a number of recessionary periods and um they are hard you don't earn as much money as you did previously um you know, as a recruiter or as an owner or whatever but you'll, you'll get fit and you'll be a better recruiter or a better owner for it no so. uh, no i think it's great what you're doing and really excited to to see it from Afar. Um, but look, Justin, been an absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed that. Just a big thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much.